And let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on developing Azure solutions. I'm going to now hand things over to our Microsoft product manager, David Mulkey. Good morning. It's fantastic to be here with all of you today during our Microsoft product month. Thank you so much for attending today so we can have this in-depth discussion about developing Azure solutions. We're hosting several webinars over the, the month of March covering some of the most popular topics from Microsoft. So please check out our website to see our uh, past webinars or to register for our future webinars. Developing Azure solutions is one of the keys to the digital transformation movement. Joining us today is Bob Thompson to walk us through some of the key things about developing Azure solutions. Bob holds his MCSD uh, in App Builder and has over a decade in the IT industry, including some consulting work uh, and project management work. So he, he brings a lot of real world experience to you today. And Bob is also one of our top tier instructors uh, with, within the, the New Horizons Worldwide Network. So please join me in welcoming Bob Thompson. Uh, Bob, the floor is yours. All right, David, thank you very much. Appreciate those, those uh, words of wisdom or whatever you like to call them, those introductory words. I hope I can live up to them. Uh, I do thank you for that. Thank you everybody for attending my little session on developing Azure solutions. And I really do appreciate you being here. Um, one of the fun things about doing these webinars is uh, you get a chance to learn a few other uh, things that you don't normally get to see in your day-to-day -day work, right? And one of the things I came across when I was doing this one was the idea of using cloud services and considering them as a uh, utility. Um, and hadn't really thought of that before. I know that they try to make life pretty easy, but if you think of it like an electric utility, uh, only it's uh, a cloud provider that provides information technology. There's sort of a, a relationship or a, a way of thinking about that that's kind of may seem a little odd at first, but if you think about what electric utility does, uh, provides electricity. We don't have a mini generating plant outside of each of our house to uh, generate electricity or outside of our business to keep it running. Uh, we're just used to going over to a light switch or whatever it is, turning it on, and boom, we got, got what we need. And we just then continue doing whatever it is we intended to do. You don't dream of having to buy, install, maintain all that electrical equipment uh, that we need to power your home or whatever it is that you're trying to provide power to. What do we do instead? We just pay a fee or a local uh, utility bill to the electric company in this case for any power that we do consume each month. Uh, we don't concern ourselves with thinking about the, the uh, mechanics of generating electricity or dealing with the capital expense of that or maintaining the equipment or repairing it after storms and on and on and on. We don't worry about that. We just pay the bill and assume that's there. And when you think about cloud services, that's kind of what uh, they tend to appear or want to appear as. You don't have to think about the infrastructure required for networking or hosting or building your uh, physical hardware for a server that you might need. So uh, it's really kind of cool when you think about it in those kind of terms. So we're not going to get into a lot of about that, but that was one of the interesting things that I kind of came across when I was uh, preparing for this. So my agenda today is not to uh, convince you that cloud computing is what you should do. I'm going to presume that you are here because you are considering doing that. You can go out and find as much, uh, as many books and articles and blog posts and whatever you want that espouse why you should be using uh, cloud computing in Azure in particular. Uh, there's just terabytes of information out there for that. What I hope to give you is just make sure you're aware of what Azure services are available, what you can have them for, and how you can approach using them. And then we'll talk about specifically some of these six items that I find most applications are uh, using in one form or fashion, or at least commonly used. Um, these are sort of the basic building blocks for many of the solutions that you would use Azure for. So we'll look at these um, and kind of give you a little bit of insight into what they are and how they work and how you might go about using them. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about the uh, Azure services. Again, going back to that utility uh, and la analogy, you don't really need to know how the computing power or services in Azure are going to be uh, provided for you in the cloud. All you need to know is they're there and you can use them. Someone else takes care of all of the underlying uh, 
physical aspects of that and that kind of sense of service you're wanting to use. So moving your compute storage and network to Azure uh, is really just like turning on a lamp in some respects. I realize that it's not that easy as plugging in a lamp and working. There's a little bit of work you have to do, but it should be almost that easy. And you also pay for what you use in most of these services. So it's kind of like the same uh, analogy of that you turn on the light, you pay for it when it's on, when it's off, you're not going to get charged for that. So we're going to look at a couple of these services that you'll see here. And uh, um, just a general description, if you haven't ever worked with Azure, it's a cloud computing service that Microsoft offers. It's a collection of many different services that you can use to host existing workloads uh, or existing servers. You can use it the managed services that they provide uh, instead of having the workload on your own environment and you just use their service. And you can also create new workloads that can be deployed to your customers and use them for yourself. It is a global network of data centers all across the globe. They're uh, continually upgrading and adding new data centers as time goes forward. And it does support many programming languages, tools, frameworks. One of the uh, earlier when they first came out with uh, Azure is called Windows Azure. And I think that a lot of folks thought it was just limited to simply Windows environment. But they have since kind of renamed that in the past few years. It's really Microsoft Azure. It does support Windows, but it also supports other uh, things that may run on like a Linux environment. So it's much more uh, widespread than just uh, a very focused type of item. And you use these different services that are out there. You combine them to provide uh, systems or services that are robust, resilient, and uh, they can stretch and grow. They're somewhat elastic depending on how you set them up. And uh, they can be global very easily. So there's a lot of interesting things that you can work with on these services. <clears throat> as far as services go, there you may have seen this slide uh, before, and I have another one after this, but it's important to kind of understand where these services uh, lie. You'll have uh, uh, what I call SaaS, or uh, software as a service. Really, it's a complete solution for your software. You basically are signing up to use an application in the cloud like uh, Microsoft 365 or Skype or Dynamic, Microsoft Dynamics uh, customer uh, relation management system online. So the advantage of using these type of services is that the user doesn't have to have any kind of installation as far as um, access, getting access to these apps. They're out there, you use them, they set up and you work with it. And users don't have to worry about updating the apps or maintaining compliance because Azure takes care of that. That's a service provider and they deal with those things. Product as a service is, uh, or PS is kind of where you have services and you use them to, uh, these resources to build your own solutions. Uh, like if you want to have a database in the cloud, but you don't have uh, the resources or a database server, you, they offer that service and then we'll talk about that in a moment. Normally these type of offerings will have a, a programming API that you could work with. Uh, there's also configuration and management interfaces that you can use either through a portal or through some PowerShell or some other ways to get to it. With uh, these types, developers and uh, your organization can create uh, custom applications that can be scaled up or down as the need provide uh, needs to be without having to provision and go out and get the hardware and support it and uh, handle all the operating Requirements. You're just focusing on what you need with that. That would be like um, the Azure Web Apps, which we will talk about and uh, inside of uh, Azure App Services, where we can just create a web app, deploy it to a um, app service within Azure, and it's available. We don't have to worry about getting the server and making all the connections for it. IaaS, which you get into infrastructure as a service, is a way to let you have more control over the environment. Uh, it's really the infrastructure is the networking, the servers. You can provide a virtual server and you have total control over it. It would just be like you take your physical server that you can touch or kick, as the case may be, and you move it to the cloud and you no longer see it, but you are interacting with it. So that's a, a, a common way that a lot of companies do start off working with uh, with these is to take the physical aspects of it and work in uh, an infrastructure. 
Um, <clears throat> there are other service offerings as time goes on and cloud becomes uh, a little more mature and you find different services being um, brought up and evolving. You're going to run across some other ones like uh, identity as a service where you now you have the need to handle uh, user authentication or providing information about a particular user before you give them access or maybe a, custom, a business client that you want to work with. Azure has that in their Active Directory. Uh, Azure Active Directory, we'll talk a little bit about that. Or maybe a disaster recovery as a service where you have uh, cloud-based backup recovery services. You can uh, make those consumable on a pay-per-use model, make them highly available and uh, scalable to meet the demand that you have. And which Disaster recovery, I had a little bit of an auditing background. I remember working with companies, and they would always have um, on paper a disaster recovery plan and look good, but they never really tested the darn thing to see if it would work. Well, using that type of a service is a great way to actually put a plan into place and test it out without really impacting any of your uh, ongoing production. So I won't say it's an easy way to test it, but it is a very good way to make sure that you have everything in place so that you can resume your uh, business very quickly. This is a, kind of the same thing, but it's kind of working toward uh, uh, getting into some of these things that are within the infrastructure and platform and software as a service. This is where some of you may be today, and I won't say that that will totally go away. You usually want to retain some type of information, whether that's uh, confidential or you just need to have it local. But this is where you're managing everything you see here, your applications, your data, all of the software that's needed to support it in the physical servers and storage and all the networking. You're, re you're responsible for all that. When you talk about IaaS, you're basically taking away uh, the virtualization, the spurt servers, the networking support. That's going to be handled by Microsoft. You still use it, and you're going to be required to deal with the software and the applications and data with that. You go to platform as a service, then you're picking up a little bit more. Now you no longer have to worry about the infrastructure part, or now you don't have to worry about the software either. You can put your applications out there like a web app. You can put your data into a database or a storage queue or storage table, as the case may be. So that's a little bit more. And then you go to software as a service where everything's out there. Uh, you're just using the darn thing, as I say. The analogy I use in class when I talk about this is infrastructure is kind of like uh, using a cabin. You know, you got the four walls, you got a roof over your head, and that's about it. You don't have any plumbing, don't have any water, don't necessarily have any electricity. You have to cut the firewood if you want heat or cut a hole in the wall if you want some fresh air. <laughs> so you have that. Platform as a service is kind of like where you go into a house. It's an upgrade. You still have the four walls and roof, but now you got plumbing, heating, air conditioning, electricity, and all that good stuff. Software as a service is more like a, a hotel or even a motel to some degree, but here you have the four walls, roof, you have electricity and the running water, but you also have um, someone who's taking care of the room, keeping it clean, uh, making the bed or turning it down. All you really need to do is exist in that room and use it. Watch TV, you know, take a shower, whatever. You don't have to worry about taking care of it. That's somebody who manages that. So that's sort of the analogy I put in mind. There's there's other ones out there that do the same type of thing, and the other common one is a, is a pizza place, but we're not going to go with pizza because it is close to lunchtime, and I don't want to get too hungry while I'm doing this. Okay. So these are some of the services that Azure has. There's, uh, I think there's uh, 10 groups shown on this slide with uh, 68 different services shown in those. There's probably some things, well, I'm sure there's quite a few things here that I missed. And if you really want to see all the services, you'd have to go look at the uh, website for Azure and you can find them. But this is a, it's a good overview of the different categories they have. They have like the compute, which is where you're going to have some virtual machines or uh, functions that you can have. These things uh, in cloud services where you're creating compute instances and actually working with servers in uh, PCs, if you will. Web and mobile, you've got Internet of Things and enterprise integration, security, and identity, and all of the other ones. I don't think I need to read those to you. So it's a matter of picking these up and deciding which one of these you really need to use. And we're going to talk about these, but thankfully we're not going to talk about all of them because I uh, really don't have a, uh, that much time to work on that. So we'll uh, just uh, pick a few of these to work with. So whenever you're thinking about 
to your solution, you really need to think about, well, which, which peach of these do I need? You know, I mean, you could start off by identifying it and not even consider a cloud platform. You can think of it all in-house, but with all of these different choices, it can be a little intimidating or a little confusing as to which one might be best, which one should you pick as a, as a developer, which is why I picked these because they're a little more understandable, a little more commonly used, uh, not necessarily the ones that would fit to every project, but one that you would pick and choose uh, for those. So in the majority of the projects or workloads, you're going to just use uh, probably a handful of all of the services that are available. When you build and test and deploy these, you can choose to use as few or as many of them as you need to make things happen the way that you want. For instance, if you want to have a database that exists and you want to move it out to the cloud, a virtual machine would be a good way to go, or you could actually port it over to an SQL database, and we'll talk about um, some ramifications of doing that things that you should consider. That may be your starting point. Then maybe later on you'll want to use some storage out there. So you can kind of have it evolve uh, as well. So thankfully we're not going to go into detail on all of these items. I picked a few that I think you might find interesting to help develop and support distributed applications. Um, oh yeah, there we go. So virtual machines is the first one I want to talk about. Um, virtual machines are going to be a way of hosting your application. There are several options for hosting, virtual machine just being one. There's also containers, there's Azure functions, there's logic apps in Azure that you could have. There's cloud services and Azure app services. We'll talk about virtual machines as well as uh, Azure app services uh, in this particular session, just to kind of give you an idea of what these are. You'll find that, you know, when you work with this um, cloud, uh, provider or any cloud provider, but Azure uh, is what we're talking about. It's not like magic. There is something physical that has to be running this. So those are just probably commodity type servers, and they got thousands and thousands upon them in the various data centers that's actually doing this work. They're kind of put together in a way that provides the services you want. So when you think of virtual machines, there's there's really the type of virtual machine that you can create to do exactly what you want to do which is the one we're going to talk about, but realize that almost everything that runs in Azure will have some type of underlying virtual machine supporting that. It may be a shared machine supporting many different tenants, clients, but uh, there has to be something, a CPU that's actually processing the statements that you need. So um, those are like with a cloud service. When you deploy it, you don't actually provision the server that runs your service. It's provided for you through a virtual machine that Azure provisions and takes care of. Okay, so let's talk for a moment about just what I mean by uh, uh, virtual machines. Uh, it's a compute on demand, and again, it gives you total control, or I shouldn't say total, it gives you lots of control over how you host the application. But when you create your own virtual machine, you're going to be responsible for maintaining that environment, such as patching the operating system, keeping the antivirus programs up to date, and so forth. You can uh, use, uh, for instance, uh, create a machine as kind of a throwaway machine. If you have a new version of some software, let's say it's Visual Studio and you want to see how well it's going to work, you can create a machine, install it, test it out, and see if you like it. You're not going to get any of your existing machines dirty. When you satisfy yourself that it's okay, you can release the machine and you're done with it. So you can use it for just uh, that time period. So compute on demand is really what it is, and you only pay for the time that you're using it. Uh, these are all based upon Hyper-V virtualization. You work with the Fabric to actually uh, have the, you make your request of what you want. The Fabric will then have a controller that will deal with the creation of that through your Hyper-V. You can also take, uh, create hard disk on your own on-premise environment, create that uh, machine uh, image and upload it and then create in the cloud a virtual machine based upon that image. So it's basically clones it in that environment. So it's kind of easy to work with those. There are a lot of existing images. You can go to um, some sites, some open source ones that have uh, images that you can use, but there are several of them already at, and uh, provided Microsoft. So you can quickly create a SQL server or SharePoint or a BizTalk server if you want to. So those are, uh, you know, what I do in one class is we create a virtual machine that it, we use for all of the testing and all of the labs activities we do. It already has Visual Studio installed and, and uh, works very nice in that sense. Um, so you can get all these in the management portal, a lot of third-party images, source and open source ones as well. <clears throat> um, often you'll see these workloads mimic what you're trying to do on-premise. 
so they can be basically exactly the same except they're going to be in the, the cloud obviously and you have to perhaps connect with them through your network slightly different but they're not going to operate any differently in that sense like web applications you'll see uh, web servers is a common one that we have particularly for like web APIs where we need to deploy those make them available the SQL server state servers SharePoint is another one that uh, is commonly used you have the web front ends or a need to have uh, web apps up front working with SharePoint this is a nice way to deploy them uh, kind of separate them out from the SharePoint environment on-premise SQL servers app services and you also have other types of um, not necessarily support of applications but support of the environment that the application runs in, like backup or recovery backup is a very simple backup solution it's automated and it uses some of the other services that are available in Azure uh, as well as Windows Server to attempt to minimize the effort that you have to put in when you're trying to back up your data it's encrypted in transmission so it does move it around backing it up in different locations it won't be uh, available if it is intercepted and it does integrate with your system center as well as the 30 and it, once you have a, a backup it only changes incremental change it's not going to pick up the entire file state that you want that we also have uh, site recovery re replicates to private clouds to a secondary location so it gives uh, deep orchestration and um, monitoring functionality so you can make sure things are going to be in place if you should need them you can quickly create recreate the virtual machines and it also is uh, integrated with some of the Windows Server uh, functionality that you may use already and again it connects to system center so you can watch the health of it make sure that it's always running available if you should need it so virtual machines again are going to be uh, two flavors of them there's ones that you create and manage those are the typical ones where I think of taking a server and punting it to, to the cloud and you still use it as you would if, as, as if it was on premise and then there's virtual machines that are underlying every just about everything that you do without you having to create it, Azure is going to provide, provision those, and then your, uh, you will use that service that's deployed on that, but you don't have to worry about the virtual machine software and uh, starting it, stopping it, and all those types of things. Besides hosting your app in a virtual machine, you can also host these in uh, one of the core service offerings in Azure. It's called uh, Azure App Service. App, uh, Azure App Service has uh, several different types of ways to host and orchestrate these services like um, web apps is one we're going to talk about but there's also web app containers mobile app and there's some other things that we can also use those are the uh, main ones but they do share features and capabilities but e each one of them will have their own unique characteristics that they bring um, to, to uh, make available to you so some of the common features include scaling deployment slots continuous delivery uh, they can connect to on-premise uh, resources if you need to have kind of a hybrid type of application you need custom domains as well as certificates those are all types of capabilities that you have through web apps um, you can also secure them using Azure Active Directory if you want to so web apps uh, it's amazing how quickly you can deploy a web app using the uh, service in uh, Azure so this is where an example of where there is a virtual machine that is supporting your web app but you're not necessarily responsible for that machine at all you're responsible for the application and deploying it but the machine that is actually you're hosting it and running it is going to be provided through uh, Azure and uh, it's very simple it is scalable so if you start off that you find that I have sufficient um, traffic to keep it at a certain level if that should jump up very uh, fast you can add additional instances of that so that it will um, handle the traffic there's a load balancer in front of that that will automatically uh, direct the traffic to all of them that you have that can be auto scaled as well based upon different metrics like if the CPU uh, achieves or raises above a certain threshold like 70 or 80 percent you can have it automatically add in one or two or three instances whatever you need to bring that volume down or that effort down of that CPU to a manageable scale and if it goes below a threshold you can also have it remove those so it handles the, the, the uh, traffic surges and uh, unuse automatically you said it kind of help you control your cost a lot better 
Um, you do have integration with Git, Team Foundation Services, GitHub. Uh, so you do have some continuous deployment with these if you want to use that. And it has support for those different types of uh, commonly used applications like WordPress, Drupal, Drupal, those types. And you can also use just about any kind of technology when you're writing these apps, like .NET is a common one, or ASP.NET or MVC, Java, Node.js, PHP, and the other ones that you see on here. They can work quite fine with web apps. There are different tiers for these, depending on what you need your web app to uh, run and how what kind of support you think you might need. Like there's a free tier. Uh, free is kind of a good way to at least test out some things, and since it's free, might as well, you know, use it for some very simple things. It is a shared resource, meaning you're running on a compute resource that other in, other clients are also going to be using. So you have a little um, competition for resources in that, but you're limited in what you can do in bandwidth and CPU time anyway, and you have very few customization options you can do. But as I say, what do you expect for free, right? You're going to get something out of there, and you can kind of start off with that. When you get into the shared, it's it's a pay. It's where the payment starts. It's a lower cost because it is a shared compute resource. So there isn't really a bandwidth or CPU limit on that, and it does give you some customization options on that. And you can see as you go move from shared to basic to standard and premium, you're getting more functionality. So if you need to have websites that are going to be pooled under the same instance so they can work together better, then you're going to have basic. When you get to the basic standard premium, you have a reserved compute instance. You're no longer sharing that resource with anybody else. And so you'd expect to pay a little bit more for that. Standard, you get uh, same thing, but standard is the level at where auto scaling comes about. Now you can create other instances of these, but auto scale is something that uh, a lot of customers that use uh, Azure want because it helps them control the cost dependent upon the load that they may have. They may not have much of a load on weekends and they may not have much of a load uh, in the evening. So during the weekday, in the morning and through the early afternoon, they may have multiple instances and they want it to automatically scale back down so they don't have to pay for all of the different instances. And all of the tiers, when you start talking about premium, you're usually talking about very high volume very quick response type of applications that need the high security and you want them to be isolated from anything else so have that capability. There are um, images that you could start off with. I think I mentioned this already, uh, similar to virtual machines. You can create a web app using one of these templates, like if you're trying to create a WordPress, then you have an image out there that you can select and it will create that for you. Go ahead and install it and move it on. Or better CMS or Umbraco or whatever one of these images you want to use. These are a few that are in uh, the marketplace in Azure, and there are several others, of course, not shown on this, so those templates make it much quicker for you to create one of those. If you're doing a custom application, you're not likely to use one of those, but there are some pre built ones that you can work with. Okay, now when you get into the uh, hosting, okay, usually you're going to have data that's going to need to be uh, accessed or stored for your application, regardless if it's a virtual machine or uh, one that you're creating or you're using some service like a web service. And so data, of course, is going to be a, a key part of any modern application. I should even use the word modern. It's probably key to any application, and it can come in many different forms and uh, fashions and shapes. Um, Azure does provide several different types of data store. We'll talk about a couple of them. Uh, SQL databases is one, and we'll talk about the things that are available for storing in the storage accounts. But you can choose from an SQL database, uh, a MySQL database. I saw where, I, I don't know if it's this Thursday or next week, but um, they do now have a service that's uh, equivalent for using Microsoft SQL database. They will now support as a service MySQL, which uh, makes it uh, very easy to work with Linux deployments if you're using that uh, type of uh, database. You also have Cosmos database and you have blobs, tables, queues, and others that belong to storage and we'll talk about those in a bit. So when you use 
these services like a Azure SQL database, you're not maintaining the virtual machine that's hosting the database server. You need to define the database with uh, an administration ID and a password and those types of things. And you specify how much computing power you want that server to have so you can support some number of transactions that are going through it. You just simply specify that. It provides the, the uh, server that will interact with this SQL database that you're going to find. So you create the database, set up the server, and then you just use it. Since it runs in the cloud, you're, it's going to be fully uh, managed by Azure. It's going to be scalable, automatically backed up, and has uh, some other interesting things as well. So this is talking about Azure databases, and we're talking about this as a service. So you have limits on each of these. So you have basic standard premium. So there are size limits for each of these different tiers that you can use. Um, basic is, you know, the lower end of it. I think um, have up to two gig, if I'm not mistaken. And then premium, of course, you can have uh, very, very large databases, but you do pay a little bit more for that. Each of those basic standard premium also have different um, throughput units. A throughput unit, or a DTU as they call it, is a measure that is a blended number from CPU usage of memory and some other factors so that you can compare basic standard premium to make sure you pick the right level of uh, support that you want in that. Um, it, this is perfect for new cloud-based applications because uh, if you're going to deploy it in the cloud, you might as well have a cloud database because it's very easy to work with and it does don't have a pre-existing database. And you can also restrict these. I, when you create these databases, uh, they're shut off. There is no firewall access. You have to open up a port actually to get to that or an IP address to allow it to get access to it. Um, if you have an existing database, they can be moved into this. Uh, you have to migrate it. Um, and if you don't rely on any special customizations in your SQL, it might be a straight migration into that. But if it's you use some different things that may not be available in the Azure SQL database, you might have to do a little bit of tweaking in your application. Rearchitecture is the term that's used on this slide for your application to make use of that. This is a, a picture I put in here just to kind of give you an idea of how many of these services operate. This is your database instance right here. So you're creating a database that it lives inside of a server that you define. You do not create the server. You, you create the database through the server, through your uh, management suite or through your application code, but you don't provision any of this. You interact with the server and your database through the service provider, the Azure components that you work with. And it manages that for you. So you're creating this inner stuff, but you're not having to worry about the hardware for the server and making sure it's up to date and running. You don't have to worry about any kind of database software either. You just need to create it, make sure that it's available get the connection string and then begin working with it. <clears throat> as far as the transactions go, um, they are not considered committed until you have um, three copies made of that. Okay, So there, when you make an update to a database, it's going to be written to the target database. That's your main database. There will be a primary replica and two secondary replicas. So essentially, you've got three backup copies at a data center level that you can use. So that <clears throat> makes sure that if at least where the database is housed, if something is goes wrong with that, <clears throat> heaven forbid somebody you know pull the plug on it or spill coke on the where your target database is, you do have replicas that are current, up to date that can be, immediately be switched over and used until the the other ones gets repaired. Uh, you can use them for backup and restoration of those as well. So if you do have some transactions that are corrupt or got messed up in there, you can back it up to a certain level. The database is backed up as a whole and can be recovered through a portal if you want to do that. And you have a retention period that allows you to go back, depending on the tier of service. So basic gives you seven days of recovery. Standard is 14 and premium is 35. Uh, then you have different types of uh, parameters as far as restoring the database if something goes out, again, depending on the, the uh, tier that you're at. Um, so you've got high compatibility with SQL on-premise, so you can work with that. Uh, now this one is slightly different. If you don't want to use a service because, or you can't use it because the database you have on-premise you're trying to migrate is so unique, then you might need to uh, create a virtual machine 
that's running as an SQL server and how's your database there. So that would be almost like a straight clone, but you can run an SQL database and work with that. That just means you don't have to do the customization that you might otherwise have to do if you're using the service database as uh, using Azure database service. This is just a virtual machine where you have the SQL installed and you're running it. So that would be just like any other connection, but you're back in the business of maintaining and customizing the software if you, or if you need to have some kind of scalability and maintain it. Storage blobs. This is another way for you to store data. Got blobs, tables, queues, files, disks. We're going to spend a little bit of time on those. I'm, I kind of wanted to uh, talk a little bit about these. All of these have um, some different characteristics to them, obviously, or you wouldn't have them. But they do have some um, shared benefits like geo redundancy. So you can replicate these to different data centers so that you can quickly recover it in the event of an individual data center because it fails, which is unlikely, but it's possible. Uh, you have encryption of data at runtime if you need it, and they also give you custom domains that you can use for referencing. So storage is uh, a key part of Azure. Anything that you really do, you have to have some place to store the information. Like when you create a virtual machine, or let's say you're running a cloud service, that cloud service is going to exist not on a machine that you create. It's going to be on some compute instance. Okay, and you can have as many of these as you want, but you're going to have to have something that explains what the service is running on this so it can recreate it if this machine could down. Now, you may have multiple instances running your application, so that's good if you have that, but you have, uh, if one of these should go down, you're going to have to have it restored, and that's where storage comes in. There's an image of this data, uh, if it's a virtual machine, there'll be an image that says you can up, have uploaded and recreated, or if it has a configuration for your service. So you'll find that storage is used almost throughout the um, Azure, but if you're using just like an SQL database, you really don't have any storage. But if you create a web app, you do have storage because you got to have a place that describes the web app and store it so it can work with those. It is scalable. It's for massive amounts of data. It's I, I can't say if it's low cost, but I would say it's probably lower cost than you trying to do it in house. And you're only paying for what you need, so you don't have to over, worry about overbuying or underbuying. You're going to pay for just what you need. These are three types of files access, and that use that term file loosely. Uh, there is a file that lets you take, uh, create like shared service, um, shared files that you may need to have uh, available. So that's one where it uses server messaging block, so that you can use it with Windows and Linux as well. Um, it's also scalable. Disk is essentially the same as file, but it's more uh, for a premium area for high I.O. and high performance devices. And blob is a way of storing binary large objects, just a, a bunch of bytes, which may be a video, maybe an image, maybe a text file, could be really anything. It could also be a, an image of your hard drive that you created through Hyper-V that you're storing. There's two types of these. There's what's called a page blob, which is used for random access, like virtual hard drives, or a drive that's associated with the virtual machine. And there's block blobs that are organized for uploading, downloading blocks so that you can have them done do very fast, so they're different, very efficient uploading and downloading of data. Queues are a way of using storage. These will hold large volume type of messages. Um, it's very low cost, simple, and it's resilient, and it holds massive amounts of data. But this allows you to create disconnected applications. Uh, so you can have your web front ends working, sending information, and you don't want to be waiting for the uh, back end, you put messages in there and another process in the back end when it needs to run, we'll pick it up and run. So you have a good way of decoupling it. We'll see this also again when we get in the service message bus. Table is a way of also having a no SQL database. We're talking simply types of data that have no particular schema associated with it. It could be structured, but it could also be unstructured, it's unlike an SQL database that will have a very fixed layout doesn't have to have that and the data can be partitioned based upon the, the key and the value so that you can quickly find the data so it's made for large amounts of data and then archive is exactly what it sounds like you archive your data service bus is another uh, type of messaging and it falls into this area of Internet of Things and enterprise integration because it's made for messaging and 
getting the message from point A to point B it's, and have your application work in a decoupled manner in a, with scaling in mind. So there's several services that uh, are provided through the service bus that help you with event ingestion and processing those as well as doing analysis of that. A service bus, if you haven't worked with that, does require um, some type of namespace in which you can create different types of services that you may want to have available with them. So again, it's uh, kind of a broker type of messaging. It's massive in scale, completely managed. You can scale these out or as, as need to be, um, but it really gives you the ability to have decoupled components and you can do this async or synchronously, but it makes sure that it, it's a very managed type environment as opposed to storage queues, which is also managed, but it's not going to be the same type of processing that you would find in a, like a service bus queue. You can have a service bus and you can have uh, topics and relays, and, uh, published descriptions. This is an example of a service bus queue where you have message senders over here web app, mobile app service, where it's putting messages into a queue and you have a message receiver. The idea here is, let's say that you have a, an application that users are placing orders. Okay, so the orders are being placed. If you don't have a queue, let's say that this order is going to go over here to this and be processed. It may take several minutes for this pro order to be processed, picked, build, and all that. If that's the case, then you're probably, um, you don't really want the user to be waiting five minutes or a couple of minutes for that, that's too long. So what you can do is have them put this in the queue and tell the user that your order is being processed and then you can have this back end service process the queue and do what it needs to do and then send an email back to the user say your order's been processed. So you decouple these through the use of the service bus queue and this allows you to scale this completely different from this. So if you have lots of, of these messages or web apps need to be scaled up, then great, you can add more or scale it down. If you have too many messages in the queues, you can always increase the receivers that are processing those so you can process more messages without impacting one type of structure or uh, hosting environment. Relays give you the ability to connect applications to or cloud services to on-premises endpoint or within the cloud if you want, but it's really ideal when you have something on premise, but you don't want to allow public access to that. So we want you to be able to get to it, but we don't want you to know where it's at. And the relay handles that. You have your service register with that so it knows where it's at, and the relay will then be able to receive these messages, pass it on to the service, and then the service can give the information information back and the relay will pass it to who needs it. Those can be one way or they can be bi-directional as the case may be. As your Active Directory, when you start getting into security, you get, you know, uh, got to make sure you do it right because it's not simple to do it. Uh, we've seen uh, news reports of companies who don't do it <laughs> quite right. Uh, you know, you would think everybody would encrypt their information so in case it does get away, at least they would have it, but that, that's not always the case. Fortunately, Azure does have several services that we can use to make it uh, uh, simple for our application. And you can have it not only be just for cloud applications, it can be used with your software as a service, it can be used with any other type of application hosting cloud. It can also be worked with your on-premise. And you can keep your on your on-premise uh, Active Directory because this is not a replacement for that, as you'll see. So when we talk about application security, authenticating users, we want to make sure that the right people get to the right information and only the right people see the, the information they need. So you can focus more on your domain, the application, the users, without having to worry about this underlying work that goes on to uh, handle the authentication. Support sign, single sign-on, so it makes it a little bit easier for your, uh, different users to get access to the same applications that they may use. Uh, without having to sign in on every one of them. Uh, it does support standard protocols you see there, and it does extend your existing directory to the cloud. There is a syncing mechanism that you can use, uh, depending on which tier you use, that will keep things uh, in sync. So you could have it kind of right back changes that have been made from one place to the other. Also handles memory uh, or password reset as well, so you don't have to have an administrator for that. This is just a slide to kind of show that it isn't a replacement for Active Directory that you have on premise. This is your on premise over here. You still have Active Directory, uh, but the Azure Active Directory is going to be working with your app in the cloud, okay, or it could be with on premise. But this slide kind of shows all of the different 
connections or different uh, communications of messages that are going to be using either the Active Directory or your Azure Active Directory in order to handle the uh, information. So if you have cloud apps, they can use this. You can also have it support your on-premise application. So you have the directory services where you can create, modify, handle user accounts. It's your typical thing you think of, managing passwords. There is syncing between the two if you need to have that. There's also extra layer of authentication that you can use with multi-factor authentication. Uh, multi-factor authentication adds on usually the uh, uh, idea of what you have. So when you typically log in, it's something you know, right? Your ID, your password, supposedly only you know that. If somebody else has that, they could log in as you. So multi-factor authentication is usually something that you have, like your phone, you get a text, or uh, uh, some other kind of ID that you can use for that. So you can use multi-factor authentication for both on-premise as well as cloud applications. So that works as well. All right, that brings me up to my end. And so I know that was sort of a, a brief review of those six areas. Um, didn't really get a chance to dive down into some of those, but hopefully you can get an idea of how you can use Azure to uh, approach these distributed applications using the Azure services. So remember, if you think of it as utility, you should be able to just rely on it always being there. And in essence, it is. You still can interact with it. You need to do a little bit more. It's not as simple as flipping a light switch. I'll admit that. But you can kind of conceptually view it as a utility in that sense where you can host your existing workloads, move them straight out there. You can create uh, uh, services that you may want to share with others as uh, a brand new packaging of the Azure services that you can market and sell. Or you can take what you currently use in-house and use one of the services to the ease of administration that you might have. One thing that uh, really isn't part of this, but there is an Azure trial account that you should check into. Um, there are services that you can actually go in, allocate and use and play around with and see what you have. They, for uh, 30 days, you get a $200 credit, so you kind of get a sense of the cost for the various things that you use. You do get 12 months of uh, free services with the trial of certain things, not everything, and you'll have 25 plus always free services like the free websites and things like that. So it's a good thing for you to check out. If you haven't checked it out before, uh, look at the Azure trial and uh, Explore it and see what you think. I think you'll find it kind of fun, if nothing else, to, to see what's available, and kind of have a better idea of how you might interact with it. That is all I've got right now, so I thank you for your time. Um, I don't know if anybody had any questions or not, Kelly, but uh, I'll try to answer them if I can. If I can't, I'll have to look it up and give you uh, an answer uh, later. Thank but do, I do thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Bob, for taking the time to present on behalf of New Horizons. We really appreciate it. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us. If you guys have any questions at this time, uh, we'll save some time and we can answer those over audio. Um, in the meantime, while you're thinking of those questions, wanted to direct you guys to our website at newhorizons.com. If you are not familiar with your local New Horizons, you can do a zip code search to find the center nearest you. There you can also see a full schedule of upcoming classes. Um, uh, on all of the various topics that we offer. So uh, please visit newhorizons.com. If you click on the webinars link, you'll see an updated schedule of all of our webinars coming up uh, through July. And these are free for you to attend. So um, please take advantage of that. There is also a webinar archive library on our website where you can access over 50 of our past webinar recordings. So uh, those are just some great tools for you guys to have. Also a reminder that this session is being recorded and you will all receive a link later today to review the session or pass on to any colleagues who were unable to attend. Okay, Bob, it looks like we've got a question on um, what are the reasons for people to choose Windows platform instead of Linux and vice versa? Um, well, that's a good question. It's not really anything related necessarily to Azure or uh any other cloud service. Uh, I, in my mind, if you're more of a Windows shop, you're going to have uh, resources who are used to developing in that um, framework, and you're probably going to work with uh, those. Um, if you're concerned about cost, there's going to be a cost with most of the Microsoft products like SQL Server and things like that. So if cost is an issue, uh, besides just the resource experience, then you may want to go to one of the more open source or like a Linux platform. Linux is not going to run certain types of uh, applications 
like it. You can't run an MVC or an ASP.NET. Um, it's got to be an IIS type of uh, environment to support those. So to some degree, it depends on the nature of your applications. If you're going to be running PHP uh, as a back end, you know, I'd probably go with the Linux because it's going to be uh, more of a lower cost type of operation. But I, I don't know that it's actually a, a distinction between Windows or Linux. Uh, it's kind of a, to me, it's more of a, well, what am I comfortable developing in? What resource do I have to create these things? Uh, are they more of a JavaScript node type of environment? Then I, that will kind of direct you one way or the other, in my opinion. So I don't know if that's a, a good answer for you, but there's, you know, it's not it's not just a toss up of a coin to say one or the other. It kind of comes down to cost because there is some fees associated with using Microsoft and stuff. Even if you use a Linux um, type of platform for a web app, you're still going to have a cost, but it's going to be a, probably a lower fee if you're using Linux versus Windows. So that's kind of how I would answer it. I don't if there's some follow up on that, Kelly, I'd be glad to, uh, to try to address it. Okay, thanks, Bob. Yeah, it looks like that was it for that question. Um, I don't see any other follow-up on that, but thank you. Um, and it looks like that actually is it, all of the questions that we've had. So thank you again so much, Bob. I really appreciate it. All right, thank you. And thanks again, everyone. Um, I will be sending you the recording link later today to review the session. Thanks again for joining us today. You may now log off. Have a great day.